Hello everyone. Good evening and probably good afternoon. I am Shweta Nemali from uh, India. I am the media secretary for Tunneling Association of India Young Members. I'm here on behalf of Sandeep, our chair today. And uh, um, it's very interesting and we're very excited to bring to you the next webinar uh, on uh, a short introduction to the Emerald Group. Um, this is a bit of a deviation from what we have been doing till now. Uh, we have been purely on technical line in terms of webinars, but we wanted to bring the contractual aspects to the younger engineers and folk out there. So we approached Matthias and we are so happy that he agreed to talk to us. And, and we are extremely happy that BTSYM and ICE are collaborating with us. And um, I hope you all have a nice session. Over to Divit, he'll introduce you, Mr. Matthias. Thanks, Shweta. Um, hi, all. Uh, it's Divit. I'm the sub-chair of professional development for British Tunneling Society Young Members. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank TAYIM uh, for once again joining hands with us and organizing this great uh, talk today. I believe this is uh, our third joint lecture and I hope uh, we'll carry on our collaborative endeavors in future uh, and deliver more talk to you. Uh, so it also gives me immense pleasure to introduce Matthias today, who's a speaker. Uh, Matthias achieved his MSc in civil engineering from uh, ETH Zurich in 1984. Soon after, he started working at uh, the Geotechnical Institute of ETH as a scientific assistant, uh, mainly working on projects in uh, Niger, uh, Africa. Uh, Matthias then carried on to gain further experience working with various companies um, around the globe on key, key projects in countries such as Chad and USA. Uh, following on from that, he finally settled back in Switzerland and gained further experience in underground and uh, underground infrastructure, uh, working as a project manager with a contractor. Matthias then joined Lombardi Engineering, initially as an owner's engineer on Gothard Base Tunnel, and then climbed the ladder to become a member of the management board and finally the managing director of Lombardi. In March 2014, he uh, left Lombardi in order to establish his own engineering company. Um, so he encompasses years of great experience, and it's a pleasure to host him today. So on that note, uh, it's over to you, Matthias. Thank you, Divik. And uh, good day, everybody. I am very happy to be here and to be able to talk to you. Uh, as you know, uh, when you look up tunnel engineer under in the dictionary, you will look under boring. And I hope this will not be too boring today, but uh, contractual issues tend to be a little tedious sometimes. However, uh, as some of you may have learned, and as, uh, as, as a matter of fact uh, happens, uh, our lives, our professional, our, our professional lives are governed by contracts, and we're they're ruled by contracts. And so it, it's a good thing to hear something about contracts every once in a while. So what I'm be, I'll be talking to you about is the Emerald Book, which is the new FIDIC and ITA form of contract for uh, form of contract for underground works. Um, this is the fruit of a uh, long cooperation between FIDIC and the ITA. Uh, talks have started in, in the early 2000s. And of course, before that, the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association, ITA, had been working on contractual issues for a long time. Working Group 3, Contractual Practices, is one of the oldest working groups. It was established in the 1980s. And uh, it, has been, uh, it has been dealing with contractual issues since. So in 2014, we started working on the Emerald Book and we published this new form of contract in 2019. So um, 
let me start and go delve into some. I will have to see how I manage the slides. Um, this will be what I'm going to be talking about. Why should we need the specific form of contract for underground works? A few words about Task Group 10, which is the joint FIDIC ITA task group and the uh, drafting process. And then we will talk about concepts, about the content, and about one of the key features of the Emerald Book, namely time and price. For some of you, some of, some of the things I'm going to say today will not be new. Uh, some may have heard some of my talks before, so please bear with me. Uh, I will try not to bore you for too long. Um, why would we need a specific form of contract? There is, of course, a, uh, an economic reason to that. Over 50% of the world's population now live in cities, and in, by 2050, maybe 75% of the world's population will be living in cities, which means we have a huge demand for space, and outside the air, we can go underground. The same thing, of course, applies when we, when we go, when we move outside cities, there is a huge scope for underground works. So underground space is part of the solution and the underground construction industry therefore has a huge future, which means that we need to have uh, contractual solutions as well in order to uh, enable the industry to provide services for a long time. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Siganto in tunnel, Tunnels and Tunneling in September 2019 said that, of course, he was talking about, tunnel and, uh, about tunnels and other underground projects. You have a 90% certainty of an average 33% cost overrun and a 23% time overrun, regar regardless of the risk assessment made by the project's protagonists. Uh, this means that underground works are inherently related to uncertainty and this is what sets them apart from other kinds of works where you have less uncertainty. High rise has less uncertainty than underground works basically because we don't exactly know where we're going when we're going underground. Underground people, underground constructors are a little like astronauts. We go to places nobody else has ever been. So we need to have contracts that cater to this, to this kind of uncertainty. Again, why a specific form of contract? If, for example, uh, the Sheikh of Dubai decides that the Burj Khalifa should have 15 stories more than what was planned for in the beginning, it is clear to everybody that the lump sum agreed contract amount will increase because he's asking for something more. Unfortunately, the same does not apply with the employers of underground works, where they say, even though things may change, I can buy in the risk sharing by the contractor uh, by simply shifting the entire risk over to the, to the contractor. Now, what may happen is something like this. We may have a foreseen geology, which is solid rock, with one difficult fault zone of 500 meters, and the contractual time for completion is three years. This is what comes out of the uh, geological assessment run before the uh, run before the start of the construction, before tendering even, because uh, the employer may have done a few vertical bores along the line, and he may have found. Uh, what is described afterwards in the, uh, in the tender documents. And what you may find, of course, is a geology which is only slightly different in geological terms, but where it may prove very much, difficult, uh, very much different in terms of constructability and in terms of time and money. You may have that the fault zone, which was correctly assessed in terms of position, is a lot wider along the line than what was foreseen. And then there is one intrusion of a very, very hard rock 
which had not been found by the geological uh, uh, geological campaign run before tender. So the real time for completion was four years, although the contractor performed as per the contract and the cost increased by 30%. And the question now is, who should bear this? Of course, either the contractor has calculated <clears throat> such kind of risks into his bid, although I wouldn't know how he could have done this. Either he has calculated this into his bid, and which means that the cost, the, 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 the tendered cost would be a lot higher and the time would be a lot longer. And most probably he wouldn't get the, uh, the works. He wouldn't get the contract anyway because somebody else would not have included these contingencies in his pricing. So either contractors have included this kind of risks in their bids, which means that the, the bid amount will be higher if this is a lump sum con uh, contract, or they haven't, and if they haven't, and if this is a lump sum contract, if this is a an EPC contract, like, for example, the Fiddick Silver Book, under the Fiddick Silver Book, the contractor will very likely will go bust. At the latest, at the third or fourth job he gets at these conditions, the contract will go bust. And this is unfortunately what we've observed in some areas around the globe, uh, not least of all Australia. So we need a different kind of contracts against the typical EPC lump sum fixed price and fixed time contracts that we uh, often see in high-rise or in large industries. I mean, you can build a nuclear power plant under an EPC fixed price, fixed time contract. But when you have major portions of underground works, uh, this is uh, really a very risky undertaking because, of course, if the contractor goes bust during the works, uh, this is no good news for the employer either. So what we said was we need a balanced risk allocation between the contractor and the employer, simply because in the long run, we will get cheaper project costs. If the risk allocation is balanced, you get the cheapest possible project cost and you get the best possible price stability in your contract. If you shift all the risk to the contractor, one possibility is that the contractor calculates this contingency in his prices and the project will cost more because not all the risks that the contractor has to include will materialize. Or the contractor will not calculate it in his bid and, as I said before, he may face major, uh, major economical problems down the line. The other possibility is that the employer takes all the risk. This would be a cost plus fee contract and this, again, is not very interesting because there is no incentive for the contractor to really perform. So we need a balanced risk allocation in order to get cheaper projects, to get better price stability, to get less claims, and uh, to have better projects in the end. <clears throat> so what we see is that un underground works are inherently uncertain. We've seen why before. We have a series of unique features, the, uh, of which I would only uh, delve into the first, which reads the method of excavation and ground support are major factors for the successful realization of the project and therefore part of the works. This is not exactly the same way of seeing things as under other fitted contracts or uh, under many other contracts where the employer will take responsibility only for the design, if any. He will take responsibility only for the design of the permanent works, whereas the provisional works, uh, the temporary works, will be entirely up to the contractor, like, for example, shoring, scaffolding, and, and, and things like this. Now, of course, the, the ground support may be temporary. It may be provisional but it should be taken into account just as the, uh, the final works, the permanent works, because without doing this, you cannot build a tunnel. Physical access to the works is often limited to a few locations. This is true for a tunnel. It's not true, of course, for a, uh, for a large open pit excavation. 
and the land between the works are uh, to be constructed typically belongs to a number of third parties. This happens wherever you have to construct underground and it will may not apply to uh, an open pit where actually the, uh, the land belongs to the employer or where anyway he has access. Um, so the allocation of underground risks is critical. We have to take into consideration a series of uh, particular features of those works and our new book addresses these specificities. So to sum it up, the ground and groundwater related risks should be assigned to the employer. The employer has had the time to prepare its tender and has had the time to figure out a feasible way of doing the tunnel or doing the underground works, whereas the contractor has very little time very often to assess his pricing and uh, cannot, cannot take into account all the uncertainties that are inherent to a particular kind of works. Which means that if the ground is worse than anticipated, the employer pays. And if the ground is better than anticipated, the employer profits. And we find that this should be true as well in terms of cost as in terms of time. Because uh, when we're talking about time, Time for most underground works is of the essence because the earlier you can commission an underground parking lot, the earlier you can sell tickets. And the earlier you can commission a hydropower plant with a huge amount of underground portions of work, um, the earlier you can start selling electrical energy, which means that time is of the essence, and if the ground is better than anticipated, the employer should be allowed to expect early commissioning if the excavation and lining is on the critical path of the works, of course. Um, so, <clears throat> in September 2014, Task Group 10 was constituted between a series of represent representatives of uh, FIDIC and a series of representatives of the ITA. Uh, we had an overall of over 200 years of combined experience in underground works with all over the world, with people who had been working as engineers, as contractors, as uh, dispute resolution experts. We had one lawyer amongst us, all the others were engineers, I think this is a fair share. If we have uh, if we have seven engineers, we can allow for one lawyer to be amongst us. More than one lawyer on seven lawyers, a lawyer on seven engineers would be kind of too much. If you have a good contract, if you don't have a good contract, you may have a lot more lawyers between you. Now, um, it took us five years, and it took us. Uh, 15 or 16 regular meetings, presence meetings in uh, different places and countless uh, bilateral meetings, web-based and in presence, and approximately 15,000 hours, volunteer hours of works, work in order to get this done. The first thing we had to decide on was uh, what is what should be the form? Should this be a vote on particular conditions of contract or should it be a standalone form? Now I will do a very small excursion on, uh, on the construction of forms of contract. A form of contract usually, or a, a contract usually consists in the contract document and the series of annexes. And in the annexes, you would have, first of all, the particular conditions of contract which means those are the conditions that are peculiar to the precise kind of work uh, you're going to build. Then there will be general conditions of contract, which means these are conditions that will be, uh, will be valid for uh, other kinds of works, for all kinds of works of that, uh, of that type. But then you will have the employer's tender, of course, and then you may have a whole lot of other documents, such as uh, geotechnical investigation, um, material testing and things like this. So 
uh, we had to decide, first of all, if we wanted to do particular conditions of contract that would fit onto several other kinds of FIDIC contracts. Under FIDIC, we have what they call the Red Book, which is a form of contract where the employer provides the design, all the design, all throughout, and the contractor does but the construction. We have a Yellow Book, which is the design build form of contract within which the contractor usually provides the design and takes responsibility for the design and will have to fulfill a fitness for persons uh, for purpose criterion. And then there's the silver book, which is a form of contract under which uh, the contractor takes all risks. This is an engineering procurement construction or EPC contract, which usually works with, uh, with constructions that have a very low degree of risk. Now, and then there are mixed forms and forms that consider also the, uh, the, the running of an infrastructure for 20 years, let's say, and things like that. But as long as it comes to construction, the main forms of contracts are red, yellow, and silver. And the question was, should we have a bolt-on or a standalone form? We decided that this should be a standalone form because the request from the industry was huge and because it was better to have something which was a work of its own. We decided to model it on the 2017 FIDIC Yellow Book, the design build form of contract, although it would have been easier to do it on a design bid build form of contract, because the, we find that the employer should take uh, some responsibility in terms of design, but we also wanted to give uh, leeway to the employers to set the cursor where they liked and see uh, and decide by themselves how much design responsibility they wanted to leave with the contractor, meaning that the contractor, of course, could optimize the design and could provide cheaper works, and how much of uh, the design liability they wanted to keep with themselves. And then we included, of course, a series of significant innovations that are due to underground construction. So this is about uh, a few things about the timeline. We had long, well, we had a long series of comments received during the friendly review process. We submitted our form of contract to over 40 professionals and had over 1,600 comments that were taken into account. All of them were taken into account, although some of them, of course, could not be integrated. We considered them all and we decided what to, uh, what to accept in our form and what not. And in May 2019, uh, we were able to launch the, uh, the Herald book in Naples. Now, let's come to the concept. This is the easiest, the simplest example that I managed to invent when it comes to an underground construction. People say, yes, this is a simple example, but life is much more complicated than this. Let's consider this as you would do in structural design, the sketches you do with your bar, which has no mass, which has only one dimension, and your weight, which has only one dimension, and which, is, which has a form of a dot, has no dimension at all, and, uh, and, and bearings that are also have the form of a dot or a point in, in space and so on, the easiest possible way to represent things uh, in order to explicit what we want to uh, what we want to achieve will be this kind of example. We have a tunnel which may be a water transmission tunnel, water transfer tunnel, one kilometer length, 500 meters of very easy geotechnical conditions and 500 meters of very difficult geotechnical conditions. Let's say in 500 meters, in the first 500 meters section A, we would have a U-type, an inverted U-type section, no invert, hardly any rock support, and that's that. And in the section B, we would need a circular section because the rock is so squeezing we would need, uh, of course, ring beams, we would need uh, thick shot creep, and so on. So, and there would be only one access to the tunnel. You can only start with section A and then go through section A first and section B afterwards. As easy as that. So the contractor tenders 
an advance rate of 10 meters in section A, 10 meters per day in section A, and he tenders an advance rate of one meter in section B, which means that time for completion would be 50 days for section A, 500 meters of length divided by 10 meters per day, and 500 meters in uh, 500 days, 500 work days in section B, one meter per day for 500 meters length. This is the bit. And th these are the ground conditions as anticipated in the geotechnical baseline report. This is the base scenario, this is the bid, and this is the contract. Time for completion, time for completion, 550 days. We will not consider the site installation and the dismantling. We will only consider uh, the excavation and temporary support. Now, what may happen is this. We may have encountered ground conditions that are better than foreseen in the baseline schedule. We will see what the baseline schedule is later. Um, we have a section A, which is 600 meters long instead of only 500 meters. And we have a section B, which is only 400 meters long. This means that the contractor advances as per the bid, 10 meters per day for 600 meters, 60 days. And then he advances 400 meters at one meter per day, 400 days, which means that he will finish the tunnel in 460 days against the 550 days that were expected in the beginning. We are of the advice that this time gain of 90 days and also the lesser cost should go to the advantage of the employer because the employer takes the responsibility for the quality of the rock, for the quality of the ground. No pain, no gain to the contractor. The contractor performed exactly as per his tendered rates. And so he will be paid what he had tendered and he will be allowed the, four, the 460 days to finish the tunnel. Of course, we may have a situation where the contrary applies. The next sketch will be a little more complicated than that because we include two concepts. Uh, please take a look at the black and at the blue lines first. We have, of course, uh, worse ground. We have only 400 meters of section A and we have 600 meters of section B, which means that 40 days for section A, according to the contract, and, uh, and 600 days in section B, according to the contract, leading to, according to the contract with the real geology and, uh, and the tendered rates to 640 days which the contractor may take to, for, uh, to finish the tunnel. The red line is what we had in the bid. Now, the contractor actually performs better. He performs 20% better than what he had tendered, which means he does 12 meters a day in section A and he does 1.2 meters a day in section B which means that it only takes him 512 days in order to finish the tunnel. Now, there's a difference of 512 against the 550 initially bid, and there's another difference between the 550 and 640. We are of the advice that the difference, uh, the difference between the initially foreseen duration of the works and the duration of the works according to the tendered rates, 90 days more time for the contractor, should go to the advantage of the contractor. The contractor should be paid for this because the ground was worse and the employer takes the risk of the ground. Whereas everything the contractor gains because he performed better, the fact that instead of taking 640 days, he took only 512 days, which means he took 128 days less than what was actually that he was supposed to, should go to his favor, which means the contractor will walk away uh, 38 days early as opposed to the 550 days that he was to do in the beginning, and he will be paid as if he had been there for, for 640 days. The making available of equipment and so on will be paid according to what the contractual agreed production rates would have been. And there lies the real incentive for the contractor to perform well. He will be paid as if he had performed as per the contract, even though 
he performs better. Of course, the same thing applies if he performs worse. If it takes him longer than 640 days to finish the tunnel, he, will, he may have to pay liquidated damages, and he will be only paid for 640 days making available of his material. I hope this has been clear. The, uh, this means we have to find a contractual contraption that allows for this kind of things, and of course that allows for this kind of things in situations that are a lot more complicated than this very easy and down-to-earth example, because this is a fair way of dealing with things. The ground-related risk is with the employer, which means better ground, less money for the employer, worse ground, more money uh, that the employer will have to pay, better performance than contractual agreed, advantage for the contractor, worse performance than contractual agreed, penalty on the contractor. So when we come to the concepts and to the key principles, we said we want a balanced risk allocation, ground related risk is with the employer, performance related risks is with the contractor. We will have a geotechnical baseline report and the schedule of baselines, we'll come to that. This is the description in terms of money and time and in terms of conditions of what the contractor will have to expect. We will have a foreseen and unforeseeable physical conditions clause, and we have an adjustment of time and price. Now, the adjustment of time and price is a little uh, peculiar because under the FIDIC uh, contracts up to now and in the other contract forms, time never was shortened. Time was only extended if uh, there was a reason to extend time, of course. But it was never shortened. Now, what we say is that in underground works, when the ground is better than expected, there, should, there might be a shortening, a shortening of time if the ground-related works are on the critical path. So balanced risk allocation, we've been, talk, we've been talking about that, but I can skip this. The unforeseeable physical conditions clause. Um, of course, in most, in most FIDIC contracts, not so much in the silver book where the contractor takes all risks, but in red, yellow books, and also in the derivatives of uh, the, the yellow books, such as gold book, for example, um, the contract will not take all risks. Unforeseeable means not reasonably foreseeable by an experienced contractor by the base day. Now, this is a sentence which is full of uh, chewing gum uh, concepts, very stretchable concepts and weasel words. What, the, what means reasonably foreseeable and what means an experienced contractor? The base date is defined, but the rest... So what we say is that we, uh, this is an add-on under the Emerald Book, is that notwithstanding the foregoing, all subsurface physical conditions described in the geotechnical baseline report are deemed to be foreseeable, and all subsurface physical conditions outside the scope of conditions defined in the GBR are deemed to be unforeseeable. This is a fork in the road. As long as it is described in the GBR, it's foreseeable. As soon as it's not described in the GBR, it is unforeseeable, irrespective of the question whether the contractor might have foreseen it or whether it's an experienced contractor or not. So we have uh, this scheme, which uh, should clarify this uh, in a graphical way too, we have unforeseeable physical conditions and we have the conditions defined, identified in the GBR, which mean that they are outside the unforeseeable physical conditions. They are foreseeable because they're defined in the GBR. The, uh, the contractual geotechnical baseline, we have a geotechnical baseline report, GBR, and a schedule of baselines. Speaking about the geotechnical baseline report, within the Emerald Book, the geotechnical baseline report goes beyond what is usually meant to be in a geotechnical baseline report, according, for example, the American Society of Civil Engineers. Um, the GBR means the report um, 
as included in the contract that describes the subsurface physical conditions to serve as the basis for the execution of the excavation and lining works. All works, uh, uh, all terms with capitals under the FIDIC, uh, FIDIC contracts are defined terms, so you will find them in the definitions, um, including design and construction methods and the reaction of the ground to such methods. Now, uh, most of you will be familiar with underground works and will therefore know that the ground will react differently to excavation according to your excavation and support method. You may have an excavation with drill and blast, which means that the ground will have its reaction. You will have different kind of wedging due to the drilling and blasting than if you do the tunnel with the tunnel boring machine. Also, you may have the requirement to have a very rigid support at first, which means you don't allow for any deformation of the, uh, of the contour of the excavated space. Or you may have, as for example, under the uh, new Austrian tunneling method or the shark creek method, as it's called also, um, you may have, you may allow for a deformation of the, uh, of, the, of, of the rim of the tunnel of the excavated space before you put in the support so as to lessen the, uh, the, the solicitation of the final lining, which means that really the method of ex execution of the works will determine the reaction of the ground to such methods which means that we expect from the employer to provide in his tender a feasible way of doing the tunnel and an expected reaction of the ground to that, which means that, of course, we put more responsibility on the shoulders of the employer, but at the same time, he will get a better tender document and he will get a better contract in the end. The schedule of baselines is the agreed benchmark of expected conditions in terms of quantities and production rates. It's like a bill of quantities for time. We will see an example of a schedule of baselines, a schedule of baselines later on. The contractor will agree to a production rate uh, in each type of ground that is, he is expected to, uh, to encounter. And the last thing, we have a guidance for the preparation of tender documents, which is a lot longer than what we have in other FIDIC books. We have some 20 pages of guidance for the uh, preparation of tender documents. And this is maybe the core document of, these, uh, of the Emerald book, because it gives a hand to the employer, uh, telling him what, according to us, he should do before going to tender. So inside the conditions identified in the geotechnical baseline report, we will have those that are identified in the schedule of baselines. For those, not only we have cited them, so they're expected, they're to be expected, but we've also agreed on a production rate. Then we have the concept of adjustment of time for completion. As I said before, in other FIDIC contracts, you will only have extension of time, if any, according to claims and according to variations, whereas under the Emerald Book, you may have an adjustment of time for completion, which means it may go forward or backward. And we will have an automatic procedure which does not, re uh, which does not require a claim by the contractor in order to, uh, to adjust the time. It doesn't require a claim either by the contractor or by the employer just for the adjustment of time. What we wanted to do with the Emerald Book also was to have a, uh, uh, a form of contract that mechanizes as much as possible everything that is of contractual relevance so that there will be no, there will be no grounds for a claim because it has been def uh, defined beforehand. So the tools for adjustment will be the completion schedule first and the program later. We'll come to that. The schedule of baselines, this BOQ time. The remeasurement principles, you will find those in the general condition clauses 8.2.1, 8.3, 8.2.2, and 13.8. And all those are schedules, which means they are lists that are prepared by the employer 
and that have to be completed by the contractor in its tender. And then, of course, we have an adjustment of the contract price. The, uh, the contract price will be a, uh, an accepted contract amount in the beginning, and then there will be an adjustment, which means that whenever there is anything that is better in terms of ground, it should cost less. When there is something that is worse in terms of ground, it should cost more. And it should also uh, allow for an adjustment of the price due to the adjustment of time. Because, for example, the making available of machinery uh, for a longer time should be paid. And if the machinery is made available for less time, there should be a part of the cost that is not paid. And all of this, again, without the claim procedure. Again, we have the tools for adjustment of the price. Um, so to sum up those key principles three and four, we have the fork in the beginning on the left-hand side that che the check whether the encountered subsurface physical conditions are expected or not. If they are as identified in the GBR, we go down the lane of remeasurement. If they're not identified in the GBR, there will be a claim for unforeseeable physical conditions and there will be a claim for extension of time and for cost. When we come to the content of the Emerald Book, we have, fifth, against the yellow book, we have 15 new definitions, we have eight change definitions, 13 new subclauses, and 27 change subclauses. Now, in, uh, the, in the yellow book, we have some 100 definitions already, and we have some 220 subclauses, which means that we have not tampered with the yellow book too much. The Emerald Book is a yellow book to all effects, except everything which is related to underground works, and in particular to excavation and lining. And of course, we have this extensive guidance for the preparation of tender documents, and we have a series of annexes that help people to uh, do their tender. Um, of course, this book has been developed in collaboration between FIDIC and the International Tunneling and Underground Space Association, and is therefore a widening of the market uh, for FIDIC uh, forms of contract. Now we come to a series of, uh, of um, definitions. Uh, I will make this uh, presentation available, of course, to the organizers of this webinar so you can have them afterwards. I don't need to go into detail of everything, uh, just about the completion schedule. Why do we need a completion schedule? We do need this because uh, for FIDIC, the program is not a contract document. The program is a project management document. It's not a contract document. It's not part of the contract. And at the same time, we need the contractor to uh, tell us before we sign the contract where his critical path is, what his production rates are, what he uh, will what he will um, agree to write down in his contract in terms of, uh, of production rates and cost. And when it comes to time, this means that we need a list that establishes the sequential logical links between all the activities that are uh, that are crucial to the contract. This is nothing else but the critical path. And we need the contractor to commit to production rates. All of this goes into the completion schedule, and the completion schedule will then be transformed into the program once we do have a contract. This is quite technical in terms of contractuality. The employer's requirements, which are uh, an important document under the contract, um, we, want the con we want the employer to give an indication on the design of the tunnel, the employer's reference design. That's important, and we want him to state where he wants to set the trigger, or where he wants to set the cursor rather than the trigger, when it comes to assignment of design liability uh, against the contractor. So the employer's reference design is part of the employer's requirements, very important. Excavation, and this is also an important term, 
means those parts of the works required to excavate, temporarily support and secure the space for the under, underground works, including anything that goes with it. So ex excavation is not just the action of excavating, but it's everything that is required to create the underground space. The GBR, we've been talking, uh, talked about, uh, talking about that. The geotechnical data report, uh, unlike the geotechnical baseline report, has a low contractual importance. It's in the bucket of all other contract documents. It includes all the data that have been collected in the beginning by the employer during the preparation of the standard. And it will be there as a, a contract document with lower or lesser importance and with low precedence. Schedule of baselines, as we said before, is the BOQ time, time for completion, <clears throat> didn't change very much. The unforeseeable concept, underground works, that's important, means all works located beneath the natural or man-made surface of the earth, including ancillary surface works. This means that anything that will finish beneath the work, uh, beneath the surface of the earth at the end, may be considered underground works. You may consider underground works in this sense also the foundation of a dam, for example, or the, uh, the grout curtain of a dam, which means that, as somebody had asked before, um, you can very easily use the Emerald Book in order to construct a hydropower plant or a dam, as, uh, as the things may be. Now something about the adjustment. <clears throat> Only excavation and lining works shall be subject to measurement and the price of those shall be adjusted. Everything else, as it uh, is appropriate for an, a yellow book contract, a design bill contract, shall be included in the lump sum agreed contract amount. And the contract price and time for completion shall be adjusted following the measurement only of excavation and lining works. Now, if there's a variation or if there's a claim that gives rise to an adjustment, to an extension of time and so on, this shall be considered, but this will go down the claims procedure, not the measurement procedure as such. When it comes to the adjustment of price, we have the accepted contract amount, which, is, which consists of the lump sum for all works except excavation and lining and the sum of rates and prices from the bill of quantities for excavation and lining works. And in one case, you may have a higher price when it's adjusted if the total resulting from the me measurement is higher than what was expected in the beginning, or you may have a lower price if the total resulting from the measurement of excavation and lining works is lower, if the ground has been better than what was expected. Time for completion, same thing. If the time due to excavation and lining according to the measurement and critical path is longer, you will have an extension of time. If the time due to excavation and lining according to the measurement and the critical path is shorter, the time should be adjusted backwards and the time shall be shorter. Of course, to the, to the adjusted time adjusted according to this principle, you will have to add eventual time uh, based upon claims that have been awarded, claims for extension of time that have been awarded uh, down the line of the works. So <clears throat> when it comes to the adjustable items of the price, as we specify in the sub, in sub clause 13.8.2.2 in the tender documents, the bill of quantities will include fixed rate items, time related rate items, and quantity related rate items. Fixed rate items are lump sums. They usually go for uh, transportation of an equipment to the site, making it available for the time that the contractor has expected to take to do the works and taking it back or it may be the access row construction of the access row may be a fixed rate item and things like this. A time-related rate item typically is a, a rate, uh, an item with a rate for a making available of uh, certain equipment for a longer time than what was, what was expected, or with a negative rate 
for a shorter time than what was expected. And quantity-related rate items are the down-of-the-mill um, usual items such as uh, cubic meters of excavation, tons of steel, numbers, pieces of rough bolts, and so on. Um, the time-related rate items are those that need more, most explanation, actually. I'm not going to go very much into detail, but this is everything that uh, will change with time. This includes the making available of site equipment, but also of the site supervision and the general costs of the site, which are independent from the production. Your site manager will cost exactly the same whether you produce a lot or whether you produce less, because he's paid per month and he has a cost per month. When it comes to measurement, uh, you, you will follow simply what's prescribed in, uh, in subclause 13.8. This would require a particular course how to do the measurement. But what, what I want to say here is that uh, under yellow book context, context, the measurement is up to the contractor, unlike the red book where the measurement is up to the, not up to the engineer, which means that under the emerald book also, the measurement will be done by the contractor and the engineer will only agree the measurement or not. Now we come to a few examples of, uh, of bills of quantities and of a schedule of baseline. This is how a bill of quantity might be constructed for the uh, example I've given you before. We have 500 meters in excavation cross section A according to GBR, GBR drawing number one. Um, we have 500 meters of cross-section B according to GBR drawing number two, for example. And then the contractor will put in this price per meter of, uh, of this cross-section, all-inclusive, and he will also price a whole lot of other things that might happen, such as uh, geotechnical, uh, geological overbreak, um, a change of the excavation cross-section, it costs, there's, there is a cost to change a cross-section from a U-shape to a circular shape. It's up to the contractor to price this. Um, you may have to reduce your rounds if you do a drill and blast tunnel uh, because uh, you may not be able to shoot as long rounds as you like to because the overbreak will become too much or because uh, you must limit your vibrations and things like this. And the contractor will price all of this. Now, you also have a typical bill of quantities for fixed rate items and for time related rate items. This may be very detailed. You may have an item for your drill rig and an item for your concrete batching plant and an item for your, uh, for your canteen and an item for your offices and so on. Or you may have one, only one item for the entirety of uh, your site equipment. And then you have the time related rate items for the extension of time of availability, let's say 150 days, and you may have an item for reduction of time of availability of your equipment. It's up to the contractor to tell us how much this costs. Um, so when it comes to the adjustment of time, of course, we have first of all the measurement for time adjustment. We will measure the time relevant items under the schedule of baselines. We will see how this works in a minute. We, we will compare this against the initial plan time as if there is no difference. We will just add extensions of time if there is any, and if there is uh, an extension of time, time for completion will be extended. If there is not, it will not. And there will be the time, for, the time of completion will be uh, the one that we find out in the end and the adjustment of the contract price as well. If there is a difference between the initially planned time and the total in the schedule of base, the baselines, we'll have to check if this has an influence on the critical path. If it has no influence on the critical path, there will be no adjustment of the time for completion. If it does have an influence on the critical path, there will be an adjustment of the time for completion. Again, you will add extensions of time, if any, and you will come up with final time for completion and with the adjustment of the contract price. 
Now, the last thing I want to show you is an example of a schedule of baselines. A schedule of baselines, as I said, is a list. It's a form which has been prepared, which has been prepared by the employer and which will be completed by the contractor. Uh, what is underlined is initially proposed by the contractor, what is a normal script is quantity estimated by the employer, and what is in bold script is simply, simply calculated, is arithmetics. So what we have is the annual production time, the contractor says he will work 313 days, he will have, he will have, to, he will have, uh, he will have 12 days of winter break, 12 days of sun, summer break, and 12 days of other interruptions per year, which he calculates. He will work two shifts, he will work nine hours per shift, and he works six, six weekdays per week. Now, this, of course, is all an example. Uh, the employer says there should be, the, the contractor should price 500 meters of cross-section A, very fair rock, and 500 meters of cross-section B, excavation section one and two, um, very poor rock. The contractor says, he will have a production rate of 10 meters per day in section A and one meter per day in section B, which will add up arithmetically to 50 days in section A and 500 days in section B. If the ground is worse, we're going to measure the difference. And this is what you see in red. We, will, we may have 400 meters of section A and 600 meters of section B, which leads to up to an, uh, an adjusted time of 640 days. Now, the second part of this form is, uh, includes a series of hindrances. If we want niches to be excavated, how many niches, that's up to the employer. How much time it takes is up to the contractor or the critical path. Reduction of, uh, reductions of round length instructed by the engineer. How many meters? This should be on the same line, 20 meters and the production of the contractor or the hindrance of, uh, estimated by the contractor, how much this uh, adds up to. You may have a geological overbreak that may have to be filled up with shotcrete. You may have other hindrances, which we don't know right now and which should be inserted by the employer. We then have interruptions, which may be planned for drilling of probe holes at face in, uh, in section one and in section two. We may have other interruptions specified by the employer in this tender, and we may have other interruptions to, to, due to the employer or out, for conditions outside the GBR conditions. These would be team hours, and here, this is filled in by the employer. The contractor won't, won't say anything, and this will add up to 1.11 work days because we have two, uh, two shifts of nine hours, 18 hours, so 20 hours will add up to 1.11 work days. We may have hindrance due to water. If we have water, it's water seepage. Before we have captured the water and drained it, how much will this? Uh, how much may this uh, influence on the production rates? This is up to up to the contractor to tell us uh, how much time he will lose in certain conditions, and this will add up to a number of days, which will be included in the uh, in the in the time for completion expected by the contractor for, and for which the contractor has priced. Then again, we go measure simply down the line of construction. We're going to go measure what has happened. We'll add up the days according to what was measured and according to the production rates tendered by the contractor. And we'll come up with the days that have been, that come out at the end by the calculus. At the end, we will add winter break, summer break, break, and other interruptions. Of course, if the works take a lot longer, we may have another winter break or we may have another summer break according to what was expected. Here in the tender, we had two years. We had expected two years. We had two winter breaks, two summer breaks, and we had eight days of, uh, of other interruptions. In the end, we have 10 days of other interruptions. And in the tender, this adds up to a series uh, to a series of days, weeks, months, and it comes up with a completion date for the excavation of tunnel number one, starting on January 5th, 2019. It will finish normally on January 15th, 2021. This is a snag we found while uh, checking the Emerald Book afterwards, which will be corrected. It's, of course, not 5th November of 2021. It's 15th January 
2021. Now, uh, according to according to all the things that have been measured and added up, worse situation in uh, in the ground, uh, a little more hindrances and so on. This will add up to a number of days, and this will come up with the end of excavation according to contractually agreed production rates and the effectively encountered ground conditions. So the contractor will be entitled to hand over his tunnel on the 5th of May, 2021. If he's faster, the better for him. He may even uh, negotiate an earlier commissioning with the employer because this is his time, this is for him. If it takes him longer, he may have to pay liquidated damages. So this is the example of the functioning of a schedule of baselines. Of course, if we have, so this is my timer. I have two and a half minutes left. Um, if, if we do have uh, a more complex situation, this will all have to flow into the completion schedule and will have to be dealt with under the completion schedule. I'm not going to go into this detail. This may be subject for another course, but uh, this is how the adjustment of time works. Now, if the contractor has the right to take 110 days more, he will have also the right to invoice 110 days of longer availability of his equipment. We've seen this here. If it takes him, instead of taking 150 days uh, more, he will have 110 days more, he will be entitled to 330,000 euro, let's say euro, of additional cost. So, uh, yes, that's what we have here. We had, the, we had the estimated quantities in the beginning, 150 days at the end, we have 110 days of, uh, of extension of time, of adjustment of time, which means 330,000 euro. There's a slight difference because it's 109.6 days. Um, so we come up against an estimated 2,690,000 euro, we come up with 2,718,800 euro, which is an additional, uh, an additional sum paid to the contractor. Now, what has happened to date with the Emerald Book? We have used the concepts, this was in 2017 approximately, uh, for the, in the European Organization for Nuclear Research and their High Luminosity Project. We've implemented the concepts in a FIDIC retro contract. The excavation is completed, and as far as I've known, as far as I've known, there uh, there are no major disputes pending. Snowy two hydropower scheme Australia. To some of you, this may look familiar. We have implemented a series of Emerald Book concepts in a bespoke contract. The, the site has started. The installation is underway. For the Agua Negra tunnel between Argentina and Chile, in a scheme financed by the Inter-American Development Bank. We have implemented the Emerald Book clauses in a mixed yellow red book contract. Of course, we're always talking about concepts and not about the Emerald Book because um, all of these have happened before the Emerald Book was published. We're looking forward to seeing the Emerald Book applied by some uh, employer. And we've given introductions to the World Bank hydropower sector, the, the transportation sector and the procurement specialists uh, and we look forward to, uh, to find agreement on the use of the Emerald Book by the World Bank as we have one in FIDIC for the use of the red, the yellow, and the silver book. So, I've come to the end of my brief walk through the Emerald Book, and I will be very happy to answer your questions. Of course, you may contact me uh, in office whenever you like, and I'll be happy to answer questions that might crop up after this presentation. I hand the, word, the floor back to Divik now, and uh, I'll be happy to, to answer questions. Thank you for the great presentation, Matthias. Um, we have already got a question on YouTube. Uh, so, the first question is from Keith Panneman, uh, who's asking, 
Since the publication of this document last year, have you found any key areas of interest which require uh, particularly, uh, particularly careful consideration when drafting to ensure an even-handed contract? Well, in, uh, this is not since publishing of this document. It's, it's uh, since I've started working in contracts, which is a couple of decades back. I would say that um, the major issue with contracts is the preparation of the tender documentation. You cannot get a good contract if you have a poor preparation of tender documents. And it is a huge mistake by employers to think that they need to prepare their tender less carefully if they shift the risk to the contractor. Nothing could be more wrong than that. So um, it's mainly about the preparation of uh, the tender documentation, uh, the assessment of uh, ground conditions, and when you cannot assess ground conditions, a careful analysis of the risks uh, that you may run into in order to cater to them in your jet technical baseline report and in your schedule of baselines and those quantities, of course. Um, as, a, as, a sup yes, please. Uh, as a supplement to that answer, Matthias, uh, and, and in relation to the, the list of early adopters that you, you showed, and, and I couldn't help but notice that I think most of the early adopters already have a rigorous uh, risk sharing regime enshrined within their industry culture. But once um, the contracts are taken up by, you know, other nations around the world, uh, do you think um, the clients will still try to have a more even share of risk? Or do you think there will be special clauses added to still um, sort of, you know, turn the tide in favour of the client? Um, of course, we cannot, we cannot prevent employers from abusing the system. We, uh, we find, and we have with evidence at hand, we find that uh, even-handed contracts, equal risk sharing, leads to better cost stability and to, better, uh, to, to a better outcome of the projects. Um, this is why we drafted this contract in the first place. FIDIC says <clears throat> in the introduction to its silver book that the silver book is not suited for works, for underground works or works with a major geotechnical uncertainty. It should not be used, period. And if a client wants to use it or if a client wants to tamper with the wording of the general conditions of contract uh, in order to come up with something that is biased, which, may, which he may find is biased in his favor, uh, very often I think he will be proven wrong. I would uh, strongly advise from uh, refraining from that. Now, what happens often also is that uh, if clients do want to change general conditions of contract, the minimum they should do is to change them through the particular conditions of contract so everyone can see what has been changed. The worst thing that can happen is that you have a contract which reads FIDIC Emerald Book under the uh, general conditions of contract and then the general conditions of contract have been changed. I would advise, of course, all contractors, but I needn't teach anything uh, to contractors worldwide to run a text search and compare the text search of uh, the contract doc document they've received against the general conditions of contract in any kind of a contract just to see if the general conditions of contract have been tampered with or not. Uh, so that also actually quite conveniently leads us into uh, the second question uh, from Shweta here, um, asking how flexible is FIDIC in general to allow for any differences within local laws in the country the contract's being applied to? Um, FIDIC contracts have been designed to fit into all legal systems, which means well, in all major legal systems. Um, it, FIDIC will fit into common law, it will fit into civil law, and it will also fit into a Sharia context. 
it is designed to fit into any jurisdiction around the world so it can be applied worldwide for international contracts. That's what the fitted contracts are for. They're, they must, they can, and they must be adapted to local law. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Uh, moving on, we've got a question from Mehdi Husseini. Um, Mehdi asks, if the employer wants to add a section which is not in the contract, can the employer instruct the contractor based on the price in the contract or sh should ask for a separate quote? Um, this depends whether the prices in the contract correspond to the, uh, to the separate section that is required. If you do have, uh, if you do have a, a separate section that can be done with the prices you have under the contract, I mean, if it's the same cross section, for example, when we're talking about tunnels and so on, you may apply the same prices. Now, the second question will be, do you need particular equipment for this or can you use the equipment which is already at hand? If you need particular equipment for this, you will have to get the, the, uh, the particular equipment priced. And there will be also the question, is this on the critical path of something or is it not? If it is on the critical path, it, will, it may lead to adjustment of time. If it's not, there will be no adjustment of time and of course of time related cost. Uh, thanks for answering that. Um, then sh there's another question from Shweta, uh, Shweta asking about how PIDIC addresses force measures, especially considering the current pandemic. <clears throat> um, FIDIC, we, um, I'm, I'm a member of the FIDIC Contracts Committee and with the FIDIC Contracts Committee at the very beginning of the, well, not at the very beginning, beginning as a matter of fact, because we were, uh, we, we had to get our act together too. But in the month of June, in early June, FIDIC issued a recommendation to be followed uh, regarding everything that, uh, that is related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would invite you to go and look this up on the FIDIC website. You find this under uh, FIDIC.org and uh, you will find the answers to your questions in this, uh, uh, in this recommendation. Of course, um, we cannot, every country handles this pandemic differently and we can, also, we can actually only uh, we can only make a recommendation on how the unforeseen situation, uh, situations should be dealt with under FIDIC contracts. Uh, Shweta here alludes to force majeure. Um, we, have, uh, we have taken out force majeure of the FIDIC wording. We're talking of, about uh, unforeseen events, rather in the FIDIC 2017 editions of contract, but most contracts in the world are, st are, st are still running under the 1999 edition where force, force majeure is a concept. Force majeure may be a way of handling things uh, in certain contexts, but force, under force majeure event, basically both parties take their own damage and take their own risks. So it's very difficult to, uh, to, just, uh, to just limit ourselves to force majeure. We have to go a little beyond and I would invite you to take a look at the FIDIC recommendations on how to handle the COVID under different kinds of contract. Thanks for answering that. Um, there's another one from Keith uh, that has popped up now. Um, Keith asks, have you had positive feedback from the contracting community on the addition of the Emerald book to suit the available contracts? Uh, we have had a lot of interest regarding uh, regarding the book and also regarding training on the book. Um, I, I'm not aware of any issue that would have arisen from the application of the book. Now, uh, I don't know where the book has already been used because the book has been published in 2019. The uh, contracting community uh, 
is still very fond of the 1999 edition of FIDIC contracts and uh, is slowly ch switching to the 2017 edition of FIDIC contracts. And it will take a little time uh, till we have experiences, hands-on experiences from employers and contracting contractors using the Emerald Book. It takes from the moment a, uh, an employer decides to use a, form, a particular form of contract, it will take maybe a year for preparing the tender documents and tendering, and then it takes one or two years in order to get a, a feedback on experiences made in application of the contract. So to answer Keith's uh, question, I don't have any feedback on uh, positive or negative on the use of the Emerald Book. I just have uh, a huge manifestation of, uh, of interest, and so I'm looking forward to uh, I'm looking forward to using the book as soon as possible. Of course, we do have feedback, although from uh, the from the implementation of the Emerald Book in this Red Book context with the European Centre of Nuclear Research, with the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, where the feedback has been positive. Um, the employer, it took a little while to the employer to uh, accept the idea of adjustment of time and adjustment, of course, of the contract price. But uh, we had good feedback when it came to the application because the fact, the mere fact that we take the most possible events out of a claims context and uh, provide a rather mechanical provision in order to deal with uh, most situations that may arise um, takes off a lot of pressure from the site management on both ends, as well the contractors as the engineers. Uh, There's another one from Medi, uh, and Medi is asking, allocating the ground risk uh, requires employers to consider early contractual involvement or employ experienced consultants prior to tender uh, to evaluate the plan, uh, what is your personal view about the approach? Um, I think an employer should always be should always be accompanied by an experienced consultant in any case. Um, as we said before, the, uh, uh, the preparation of tender documents, whether it be for the Emerald Book or any kind of other contract, requires uh, a certain number of actions to be taken by the employer. The employer very often is not an on-ground specialist, which means he will take, he will have to take uh, uh, an experienced consultant to provide this for him. This is, by the way, something that uh, FIDIC would recommend. Um, another concept is early contractor involvement. Um, this mostly depends on the jurisdiction. Um, the contract, of course, only comes into place once that the works have been awarded. Before that, we don't have a contract. Before that, we have a tender procedure and a performance strategy. And um, in some jurisdictions, it will be allowed to have an early contractor involvement. It will be allowed to discuss the geotechnical baseline uh, report and to adapt it before, uh, before the, uh, the signature of the contract. Um, it will be allowed to negotiate prices, whereas in other jurisdictions, all these things will not be allowed. So we do not express ourselves on how the procurement strategy should be applied or what procurement strategy should be, uh, should be taken, but we uh, stick to the, to the contract. We only give a guidance on what the employer should do in his preparation of the tender documents before going to tender at all. So um, early contract involvement may be a good idea, but it has to be allowed under the uh, under the, the relevant jurisdiction. 
Thanks for that. Um, I've got a final question, I think then we'll uh, wrap the Q&A. Um, so, we went through uh, the various stages of compensation events and so on, um, and, and changes to time and cost, but how does Emerald Book um, sort of tackle early termination uh, prior to the works actually being finished? Uh, would the contractor be liable for liquidated damages or damages in large, or would that be governed by the final form of the, 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 the contract takes? Um, early termination of the contract is, uh, is regulated under one of the clauses, I forget which one, under the Emerald Book, which is exactly the same as the one we have under uh, the Yellow Book, or uh, as we may have under the Silver Book, I think the ter termination clauses are more or less the same. Termination will depend, uh, well, there are reasons for termination uh, for the contractor and there are reasons for termination for the employer. And according to what reason the termination is due to, uh, either the, the contractor will have to, uh, will have to uh, indemnify the employer or the employer will have to indemnify the contractor. Oh. All right, thanks for answering that, Matthias. And being mindful of the time, I think we should uh, bring the Q&A to a uh, wrap. So thanks a lot for your presentation today and sharing your experience with us. And amongst the other takeaways, which were mostly around, um, around the contract itself, but uh, there was a key takeaway, especially as a, as a sort of young tunneler, that sound commercial decisions need to be backed up by sound engineering. So it's ever so relevant for us to actually make sure that our technical knowledge is up to scratch as well. Uh, so thanks a lot once again. Um, and it was a pleasure uh, to host you today on behalf of uh, BTSYM. And uh, just a reminder to those uh, still watching, uh, we do keep on hosting regular webinars on our YouTube channel. So if you just subscribe to it and press the bell icon, uh, you should receive a notification whenever we uh, schedule the next one. Additionally, if you follow our social media handles, uh, which must be appearing on your screens right now, you can stay in the loop with what we have got planned in the coming uh, months. So on that note, I'll hand over to Shweta to uh, wrap things up uh, on behalf of TAIYM. Thank you, Divik, and thanks a lot, Matthias. I am hearing you again after two years. Um, I know this would be a wonderful session, and I'm really, really happy, and Tayyam is extremely proud to host you. And um, as Divik already has pointed out, it's very interesting in the initial part you mentioned that the panel actually had about nine engineers and one lawyer it tells us the importance of you know how an engineer and the contracts have to be in line although it's a very heavy subject in general for engineers but now after this presentation i hope especially the young tunnelers and engineers understand the importance and the and the value of understanding contracts uh, with that, I would again um, uh, say thank you to you and request all the young channelers uh, to also follow our handle of TAYM on LinkedIn and other social media. And um, um, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Matthias.